Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Rob Strecce. Rob, one of the things we're talking about today on theCUBE, day two, is sustainability. Um, we know that AI has enormous potential, but it also has an environmental impact. And, and we talked about it with Mike Ferris just now, you talked about it earlier with Chris. This, this, is, this, is, this is something that Red Hat's really digging into. Yeah, no, I, and I'm glad to see it because I think it's, uh, you know, we're starting to see organizations putting this into the RFPs to get better knowledge of what's going on under the hood from a sustainable perspective because it was uh, noted that for every five chat GPT uh, actual prompts that you do, that's 16 ounces of water oh. into the environment. So I, I think, again, when you start to look at that, how do we get this under control and not really impact the environment? Because there's other articles that have been written about how much energy, that it's the, the, already the energy of Germany being used for AI, wow. which is just crazy. Mind blowing, mind blowing. But a, gr a great segue to yes. introduce our next guest. She is Erin Boyd, Distinguished Engineer, Director of Emerging Technologies at Red Hat. Thank you so much for coming, for returning to theCUBE. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I, I, I really will want you to talk about what Rob and I were just riffing on, which is the, the, in, the environmental impact of AI in terms of its energy intensive processes, in terms of data center operations and mining resources. How do you, how do you, how big is this problem and how do you even just start to approach it? Right, I think it really has been the elephant in the room for some time. And there has not, there's been a huge gap within the software ecosystem and the communities really to address what we're looking at here. AI has just accelerated the need to look at how we're using our resources responsibly. You know, along with secure supply chain uh, constraints, I think you and I talked about this last year yeah. where now companies could not, uh, you know, populate a data center with, you know, homogenous hardware, and so, you know, these two things combined have really forced us into a way of thinking of, again about hardware, hardware utilization, and then AI. How do we do this responsibly? And so, Project Kepler, which Chris Wright mentioned today on stage, and we've been hearing about, is really the first project in a suite of tools that we plan on bringing forward through the community um, and then products within Red Hat. Kepler being the first that's really an observability tool. There was really no standard way of measuring this in the hardware ecosystem, depending on how you were running. So Kepler um, goes all the way down to the kernel using eBPF to evaluate you know, what is the true uh, impact of that and actually uses a very tiny AI model to look at this over time and find patterns. So Kepler's the first one. The next one is called Climatic. The name just changed, it used to be called Clever, so if you ever look back, it used to be called Clever. And Clever really talked about how do we then take the observability and metrics we get from Kepler and actually make decisions about what we're going to do within our ecosystem. How can we better decide how we're going to schedule this across it? And then the last project is called Peaks. And Peaks is about how do we use um, auto-scaling within Kubernetes to be able to scale it up and scale it down so we're not keeping these resources online when we don't need to be. Yeah. Which, was, which was the big discussion point just a couple months ago back in Paris at KubeCon, CloudNativeCon, uh, was about how do we make sure that when we're, because I think people, and we can talk to this because I think this is right up your alley as well, they're looking at how do we not only scale up and scale down but, you know, we have these GPUs sitting around all the time. Right. And it's like maybe we don't need them to always be on or we need to segment them and things of that nature. How, how are these projects from a sustainability perspective going to help you know, organizations kind of wrap their hands around this? Because a lot of them are looking at it going, okay, this is great that you know, there's a bunch of sandbox projects right. in CNCF. How do I really affect the outcome? Uh, then I'm, I can meet my, you know, scope one, two, and you know, then they're going to look at three and talk to you about that. But right. Yeah. So one of the announcements actually at KubeCon Paris was that they're going to make the parameters for GPU utilization no longer opaque. It's going to be a first class citizen in Kubernetes. So we're first recognizing that, hey, one of the workloads that we're going to run on Kubernetes natively is going to be an AI workload. And we need to be able to you know, fractionalize the GPU usage so we can use it more instead of like keeping it over here, you know, wasting that resource and having to purchase more GPUs. So that's, you know, one of the things. The other thing I think that wasn't at KubeCon EU that is we're talking about here at Summit today is Instruct Lab, which is how can we actually 
make our models smaller. So, you know, I, LLMs are here, they're not going anywhere, but I think, you know, because I work in emerging technologies, I think we are going to see different model architectures besides LLM. We're going to start seeing um, smaller models and really purpose built for business needs, but even beyond that, running those on the edge. Like, we can't run a large model on the edge. We have to run it in these tremendously big, you know, data centers. And so for a lot of our customers, it's really important, both from an efficiency and a data privacy point of view, that we can then change these models so they could actually run on a very small form fit uh, device, maybe even a CPU. So what, you know, if, if I have my crystal ball, I really think that we're going to start seeing a lot more efficiencies around not just GPU utilization, but how can I actually run this model on a CPU? Yeah, I, I, and I think part of it is we, we like back in September, I, I would lo love to say we were uh, just wicked smart about this, but when you started to look at, we <laughs> actually came up with this power law distribution for Gen AI, yep. and when we looked at it, actually far left side, you have the big models, huge models, and then as you go out into more industry specific, you actually have, they come down in the size of the models, exactly what you're saying, and we've, in the organizations we've been talking to, that's absolutely how they're looking at segmented or small language models and other different techniques. Are you, are you seeing other techniques like mixture of experts and other stuff being starting to be utilized so they can use smaller models but they're more fine-tuned towards what they're you know, trying to get at? Yeah, absolutely. And that's really where Instruct Lab is built on the fine-tuning piece of that. Yeah. So you know, I can take the knowledge and skills that I need within a model and I can actually apply those and see the results of those rather than having, you know, needing to train it with terabytes of information on a really big infrastructure. So I do think that it's, you know, moving more towards purpose built. It's also reducing, you know, the complexity of the model as well as improving the precision that it's delivering. So I think it's kind of a win-win. Yeah. And what are you hearing from customers on this? I mean, we, we hear anecdotally, and actually research backs it up, that Europeans are so much further ahead in, in terms of care and concern about ESG goals. How do you, how do you what, what is the feedback you're getting from customers, and how do you balance that tension of, no, this is really important, we, we, we should be focusing on this? Yeah, I actually, you know, completely confirm that that's the wave that we've seen. It's really been both communities and customers from you know, our Asia Pacific and European that are pushing that this is critically important. They're making business decisions whether or not they can have, adhere to these policies and have that be verifiable. And I think that's really important why it's an open source is because we're not selling a tool that's providing these metrics without being able to completely verify them all the way down to the hardware, bring in those partners within the ecosystem, uh, provide those metrics across all of them. So it, it, it's an interesting trend that we haven't seen. Yeah, I, I, th I think this actually, this week and uh, a lot of the discussion in the keynotes, I've probably heard more about hardware than I've heard in a long time at a Red Hat <laughs> conference. And, and I, I think Silicon Sexy and all of that and all of the GPUs. Help us understand where, where you're seeing kind of the evolution. Like you said, I, and I totally agree, CPUs are going to be in the, in the mix yep. for this, for AI, especially when you get to inference out at the edge. Like, I can't see a, a ton of GPUs being on a cell tower. Right. And things of that <laughs> nature. I just don't, I mean, out in the middle of nowhere, power, all of that. Yep. How do you see the hardware and the support of that hardware evolving from a Red Hat perspective? Yeah, so um, as you know, um, we have support for ARM within yeah. RHEL. You know, that's a good first step. Um, there were several customers and communities actually at KubeCon EU that talked about completely transforming their data center to be paved in ARM, to be able to lower that overall uh, carbon footprint of that. So, you know, that's, I wouldn't say necessarily like a cutting edge architecture, but there's definitely a recognition that there is going to be a need for hardware that consumes less. Um, and so I think ARM is leading that charge, but there are definitely other companies looking to how do we um, tune you know, certain hardware architectures to be able to do this um, more efficiently, more purpose-built, um, and I think you know, it'll be really the convergence of the models and the hardware that make that possible. Yeah, I, I mean, I look at it and I, 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 my, my son's getting his computer science degree. I almost want him to get a plumbing degree because liquid cooling and all of this other stuff <laughs> going back into these data centers to really help lower this and make it more sustainable. Right. Are, are you seeing that uh, 
as you bring out things like Kepler and others, that whole suite that really people are saying, okay, help us not only with this, but how, what does that mean for our, where we place these workloads? And because obviously you're in the hyperscalers, you're in Colo, you're, you're on private cloud, you're in all of these different places with OpenShift and, and RHEL. How do you see this helping them for placement of those workloads as well? Really, so that's really clever and Peaks really help with that placement. You know, can I get a profile of what my application is using and understand maybe I don't actually need to run this on a GPU. Maybe I get really good performance on a CPU and then where within my ecosystem in my hybrid cloud could I actually be running this that has the capacity, that has maybe um, you know, less utilization to be able to spread that out. So those are definitely the tools that we're looking at where placement is important and the capabilities you have across your hybrid cloud. So maybe you recognize I only need GPUs you know, one eighth of the time for my workloads. You know, looking at the observability metrics from Kepler, you can then understand, I don't need GPUs in my data center. I need to just be able to burst to the cloud and maybe I want to protect that data through confidential containers or through federated learning and bring that back into my data center. But really these emerging technologies are helping push the envelope forward around the goal of sustainability but supporting the customer in the hybrid cloud. So what I'm really hearing from you is, is Red Hat, and this is, and this is Red Hat's approach and philosophy and everything it does, but a really community-centric approach to sustainability. How, how is this positioned in the market? And I know that you're not in marketing, you're a distinguished engineer, but how are you, how do you think about getting the word out and making sure, as, as you said, customers are making real bottom line business decisions around, around these issues. How are you positioning this and making sure that, that, that people know about this, that your customers know that this is, these are priorities for you? So I think we've really done a good job in that our customers are forcing us to this. And that's what I love about the co-innovation that we have at Red Hat, where we're not having to take a solution already ready built to a customer. We're really trying to start at a point where we're talking about our customers about these pain points, especially our European customers, and talk about what do you need? What are your sustainability goals? How do you want that to be a policy driven decision? And what tools can we build collaboratively with you and the community to do that? And so Kepler really, we talked about it last year, was kind of at its infancy. Um, you know, went from being a couple developers on my team to a huge ecosystem, and it's really the standard by which we measure applications in the CNCF around, you know, what is their footprint? Are, are they being efficient for it? So it's really that community and customers that are actually a forcing function within this. So one of the things we're going to be delving into today a little bit uh, more is really security. And zero trust is you know, still a huge thing. RSA conference is going on over in San Francisco. Help us understand where and how zero trust gets applied basically from a Red Hat perspective and the solutions that you're embracing. Sure, so zero trust is not something that is a product, yeah. right? You can't just deploy this and it suddenly makes everything within your ecosystem work correctly. And so, you know, within emerging technologies, we're really looking at zero trust all the way down to a hardware bill of materials, all the way up to the application. And at every single point within that evolution, we have to know that we have attestation, we have to know who is accessing that, we have to know the network that it runs on. And so it's really taking our products and figuring out the gaps between those and how we will truly deliver a verifiable zero trust solution. Because there's also a lot of compliance that's around zero trust, especially when we talk about government sector. You know, there's very specific guidelines at which we have to adhere to. So really being able to develop a solution that helps uh, a customer verify that zero trust posture is super important. And then that was a big piece of image mode. It was also that having something that can, like you said, it's, it's part of the solution, it is not the solution. The solution is multifaceted in that right. way. Well, and image mode is a wonderful example of that because it allowed us to take what's so great about RHEL and the confidence and security we have within RHEL, augment that. But where we augment that, we're also using trusted, secure supply chain to be able to sign and verify those things. So we're not introducing you know, nefarious 
pieces into the supply chain, we're making sure that we're keeping it secure all along the way, and those are some of the tools. And you know, as Chris kind of touched on as well, is AI disrupts this as well. How, how do we know, you know, what's the data within the model? How do we know that the model that I've deployed within my enterprise is secure for my employees to be using? You know, everyone's experimenting. How do we know our employees aren't going out to chat GPT and exposing IP information? And so really building both secure AI models that we can sign um, and secure within a secure model registry um, with policies around this within the enterprise is going to be really important to our customers to be able to navigate this disruption and this risk. And I think Red Hat is you know, perfectly poised to be able to address that challenge. Yes, and so there's some big questions ahead. And Aaron Boyd, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. Great thank conversation. Thank you for having me. I'm Rebecca Knight for Rob Stretch. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of the Red Hat Summit. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in tech news and analysis.